A man is dragged into a prison cell, kicking and screaming, but it's too late for the officers on watch to do anything. The door to the cell is barricaded from the inside, and all those officers can do is plead to the man's captor while they hear him howl in pain. For hours, this goes on until at some point the victim's dead body is held up to the window of the cell. The cell door is opened, and to the guard's utter disbelief, a spoon is stuck into the victim's exposed brain. His head looks not dissimilar from a cracked, boiled egg. That's just one of the reasons why the protagonist of this story, one Robert Maudsley, is dubbed Britain's most violent prisoner, aka the real-life Hannibal the Cannibal, or to others, the Brain Eater. Born on the 26th of June 1953, Robert Maudsley did not get what you might call a good start in life. He might one day be nicknamed Spoons, but he certainly wasn't born with anything close to a silver spoon in his mouth. Quite the opposite, in fact. When he was just six years old, he and his siblings were taken into care when the UK's social services discovered that all the children had suffered neglect at the hands of their parents. He was one of 12 children in that working class family, but it was his brothers Paul and Kevin and his sister Brenda who would share the same care home. That was a place called Nazareth House, a Catholic orphanage in Liverpool, England. Care homes sometimes don't always have a good reputation in the UK, especially ones from back in those days. But it was there that the highly intelligent Robert would have a good relationship with the nuns he loved and trusted and the siblings who lived with him there. Then, after eight years living in the care home, disaster struck. The parents, a couple already accused of being unworthy to bring up children, took the kids back. What was passive neglect in the past would now become active torture. Their home became a house of horrors. The kids were beaten daily, but the extremely violent father, the perpetrator of most of those beatings, liked more than anything to take his rage out on young Robert. He looked upon this one child with a special kind of hatred. After all, it was Robert that tried to stick up for his other siblings. At one point during his preteen years, Robert was locked in a room for six months. The door opened when he was given scraps of food and glasses of water. If it wasn't feeding time, there was only one other reason why that door was unlocked. Speaking to a psychologist from possibly the world's most secure prison cell, Robert would later recall, I can always still remember now when he turned that lock when he came in. He'd have a poker or a piece of wood in his hand, or even a rifle, and I can remember he busted that rifle over my back, and when he'd beaten me, he closed the door. I'd hear the key turn and he'd walk away laughing. Such was the depravity that Robert experienced, a boy that would become known as a Mr. Maudsley the serial killer. It was after these series of beatings that his mother and father sent him back to social services, and from there Robert lived in various foster homes. The father told his brothers and sisters that Robert had died, and that was that. They wouldn't see him again, and there would be no funeral. The other kids were too young, too afraid to question what had happened to their brother. When Robert became a teenager, he left Liverpool, but the scars from his past would prove to be the locus of his future direction. He got the bus down to London, hoping that there was something new and exciting waiting for him. But in the big city, all he found was more pain. The young man couldn't escape the abominations of his past. He didn't exactly thrive on the streets of London and spent years on and off staying in the city's psychiatric hospitals after attempting to take his own life. He became enmeshed in hard drugs, and to feed his addiction, he offered sexual services to men he met in the city's pubs and clubs. While working as a male prostitute in 1973, he met a man named John Farrell. This is when Robert, now just 21 years old, killed his first person. In what might be considered shameless and vile gloating, Farrell showed Mosley disturbing images of children he had sexually abused. This resonated with Mosley. He was incensed, and he snapped. He was looking at the images of children that had shared a similar fate to his own. He lured Farrell into a public toilet, and with a garrote he'd fashioned from a necktie, he strangled the abuser to death. This was a very personal kind of crime. Mosley watched fixedly as the life force drained from his victim. He took pleasure from it. It was revenge for his own childhood suffering and for the suffering of the boys in the photos. The excitement, the pleasure that Mosley derived from this violent act would be felt again when he got up close to other people he considered beasts of the earth. Mosley, undoubtedly unhinged and dangerous himself, had no scruples about murdering men he viewed as animals. Following the strangulation, Mosley didn't even attempt to hide the crime or run away. He was soon picked up by police who gave him the nickname Blue due to the color of the man's face who he had killed. For Mosley, he had done the world a favor. He rid the streets of a man who made innocent children suffer. He'd become a vigilante, a deranged rebel with a cause, and if you asked him about his actions, he'd tell you he'd done the righteous thing. In his own mind, he'd killed his own father, or at least someone that represented the reprehensible things his father had done. Mosley was handed an indeterminate life sentence and later sent to Broadmoor, a psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane. There he was locked up among some people he detested the most men who abused children.
For some years, Mosley didn't strike out, but then in 1977, when he was 24 years old, he and an accomplice grabbed a convicted pedophile named David Francis and rushed him into a cell. What followed was a nine-hour attack in which the victim was mercilessly beaten and tortured. After the nine hours, when the prison officers finally managed to get through the door, Francis was dead. A spoon had been stuck in his ear and had penetrated his brain. Multiple injuries show that he'd sustained a gradual but extreme attack. According to one prison guard, the victim's head had been cracked open like a boiled egg, and bits of the dead man's brain were missing. Again, Mosley was convinced he had done the moral thing, and he'd only taken out another evil person. For this reason, the authorities said the crime was premeditated, and so Mosley was in fact not insane. He was moved to Wakefield Prison, at the time a hellhole nicknamed Monster Mansion, and well known as a place feared by criminals. Because Mosley had hated being moved as a child back to his parents' house, he resented being moved to a prison. Yet again, many people who inhabited that prison were the kind of men that made children suffer in the worst ways imaginable. What Mosley saw all around were his nemeses, men who needed to be removed from the planet. He believed he had every right to do what he did. In a letter many years into his imprisonment, Mosley wrote, I can say that yes, I have been raped and yes, I have been sexually abused by such people, and consequently I do detest these people enough to have killed them in the past, so we have their circumstances from my childhood and adolescence. In July 1978, only around a year after the Spoon incident, Mosley made a plan. That was to kill seven child abusers in the space of one day. Since he'd been in Wakefield Prison, he'd taken his time to know who was who, and over a few months he picked out certain people and put them on his kill list. On the day he planned his murder spree, he invited a man named Solly Darwood to his cell for a chat. Darwood was serving time for killing his wife. No sooner than he entered Mosley's cell, he was stabbed several times with a homemade knife, commonly known as a shiv or a shank in the USA. This time, he hadn't actually killed a child abuser, but in Mosley's mind, he killed the person he believed was scum of the earth. He thought he'd done the moral thing. Criminologists sometimes call this kind of killer the missionary type, because they perceive their killing mission as justice being served. While mission serial killers are inarguably maniacal, it's not common in prison for men to justify the murder of a child or a woman abuser as a righteous act. The act is supposedly mitigated by the offense the victim was convicted of. Maltzley wouldn't stop until, in his own mind, he had cleaned up the prison. He pushed the now-dead Darwood under the bottom bunk in the cell and started calling out more names, asking people if they wanted to come for a chat. No one accepted the invite, so with knife in hand, Maltzley went on the prowl. One prisoner would later recall that he could see murder in Maltzley's eyes. The toughest men in the prison feared for their lives. While walking along the landing, he soon arrived at another cell, this time occupied by a child abuser named William Roberts. Within minutes, Roberts was dead. His head had been smashed against a wall several times, and his skull had been hacked at with the shiv. Mosley then calmly walked up to the prison officers and said to them, there will be two less people for roll call this evening. So in 1978, Mr. Mosley, no longer a man the prison staff wanted roaming their landings or exercising in the yard, ended up in solitary confinement. To say he would stay there a while would be an understatement, because he's still there now and is Britain's longest serving prisoner. But that story doesn't stop there because at the time, Few people had ever heard of Robert Mosley, at least the general public had no idea who he was. In the years to come though, he'd become a household name. In 1982, the BBC went to Wakefield Prison to make a documentary about solitary confinement, and they found a man confined to a cell, a man known as a bomb that the authorities couldn't disarm. They discovered someone who had been labeled as a kind of penitential enemy number one, and indeed the prison's most dangerous prisoner. Mosley's name was soon all over the British tabloid press, with some of the more spurious stories saying that this crazed man had eaten the brains of a fellow prisoner. While that wasn't true, and it's known by most people in the UK that the tabloids often don't let the facts get in the way of a good tale, the prison now felt it had to make an example of Mosley. Its answer to solving the problem of Mosley's infamy was to do something quite drastic. That was to create a kind of cell that had never been seen in the UK before, and perhaps has never been seen anywhere else in the world. It was a place the authorities believed Mosley could cause no more harm. In 1983, they built a maximum security special unit within a maximum security prison, not in the actual prison but in the basement of the prison. Mosley's new cell was a reinforced bulletproof plexiglass cage, a cage where he was under watch 24 hours a day. To get to the cage, guards must open a solid steel door. Within the cement walls of the cell is yet another cell, and that is the exterior that is the plexiglass cage. A psychologist that visited Mosley there called him gaunt, emaciated, sunken-faced figure with long, straggly hair. 
Although he has a high IQ and is a fan of reading, he is not allowed any books. Although he's a fan of classical music, he's not allowed to listen to music. In fact, his own words is there is nothing in this cell but damp walls and cockroaches. The guards have been told not to talk to him. So when he does occasionally get an hour outside in yet another cage, he doesn't get to speak. If he even looks at the guards, they avert their eyes. When he does go outside because of his violent past, he has to be escorted by four to six guards. This has gone on for years, and because of this absolute isolation and lack of communication, he's developed speech problems. He's literally going out of his mind and has been denied a pet budgie so that he might have some company. The authorities have also denied his request for a cyanide pill so he can take his own life. Robert Maudsley is now 66 years old and has served 46 years in prison, with around 40 of those years being in solitary confinement. When he's been given the chance to speak, he has said that this solitary confinement is a constant reminder of those six months he spent locked in a room as a child. It's unlikely he'll ever get out of prison, and unlikely that he'll ever get out of his glass cage in the dungeon of Wakefield Prison. Maudsley believes he's a victim of circumstance more than anything, and that the people he killed was a form of displaced anger related to what had happened to him as a child and a young man. Not surprisingly, he mostly blames his parents. We'll leave you with these words he once said, When I kill, I think I have my parents in mind. Had I killed my parents in 1970, none of these people need have died. If I had killed them, then I'd be walking around as a free man without a care in the world. Do you believe that? Now you need to watch this show, Man So Violent Even Other Prisoners Fear Him. Or this video, why was this prisoner kept locked away in permanent, total isolation?